Hello, my name is Michele Paulato, and I'll be talking about constraining the seismic properties of crystal mush from pathologically constrained microstructure. This is preliminary work that I've been carrying out with several students from Imperial College of London, including Andreas Joachim and Jorge Avalos Patino, who worked on the finite element method that I'll be talking about later, and Chloe Sperling, who worked on the FFT-based method. My take-home message is that if we want to learn more about the structure of uh, magmatic systems in crystal mush, we need to better understand the constitutive relationships that link melt microstructure and melt fraction to seismic properties. And we can do that by using rock physics methods that are widely used in uh, many engineering disciplines. When I started my research career in 2007, this seminal review paper on volcano tomography had just come out. And the view in the paper is rather gloomy. These are some of the quotes. Most anomalies are found to be in the range of plus or minus 10%, where the much more difficult task of estimating the fraction of partial melt has been attempted, these efforts are speculative at best. There is a general lack of strong evidence for large regions of pure melt. The velocity anomalies can be characterized as amorphous blobs. Now, despite the shortcomings in the last 20, 10 to 20 years, volcano tomography has become one of the key pieces of evidence in support of the MUSH model. For example, Cashman and Giordano in 2014 wrote, geophysical study of active volcanic systems have failed to locate large volumes of crystal poor melt. These observations are difficult to reconcile with a classical magma chamber model. Jackson et al. in 2018 war wrote, Geophysical data suggest that reservoirs have low melt fraction, even beneath active volcanoes. So let's have a look at some of the more recent volcano tomography studies. I've been involved in some of these, particularly on Montserrat and Santorini, but there's other excellent data sets from Mount St. Helens, and Altiplano Puna and many others that I don't have time to discuss. So this more recent study show seismic velocity anomaly as large as 20% and sometimes more, but the melt fraction that they estimate is usually around 10%. What's very important to notice here is how wide the uncertainty range on these melt fraction estimates are. This is because of two limitations. The first one is the limitation on the resolution of the seismic imaging methods. For ray-based approaches, the um, theoretical resolution limit is given by the width of the Fresnel zone. And for crustal studies, this is typically three to six kilometers. And that means that anomalies as large as several tens of cubic kilometers can go undetected or at least be very strongly smoothed. Now, this is because uh, wavefronts wrap around low velocity anomalies and heal behind them, resulting in uh, limited recovery of the strength of those anomalies and uh, a general high VP bias. In the last 10 years or so, there have been some exciting developments in full wavefront inversion. And these promise to bring much better resolution uh, with a resolution length uh, as small as one kilometer and possibly smaller. The second limitation, and this is one I want to focus on today, are the large uncertainties in the rock physics methods that link melt fractions to seismic properties. Most published melt fraction estimates from seismology are based on semi-analytical methods that assume simple melt inclusion shapes, usually ellipsoidal. The sensitivity of VP and VS to melt fraction depends strongly on the chosen melt geometry. To exemplify this, I'm showing results from the Juan de Fuca Ridge from uh, Arnoux et al. 2019. It shows that if we choose uh, different melt geometries, we can get widely different melt fraction estimates. This can be explained by looking at a melt fraction versus VP and VS plot. Let's assume we measured in the field a VP of 4.8 kilometers per second. If we assume an aspect ratio of the inclusions of 0 0.1, we would get a melt estimate of 23%. But with different aspect ratios, 
we would get uh, med fractions as low as 9% or as high as 32%. So how do we do better? One way is to use what we know about the microstructure of the melt to predict the seismic properties. So first we need to recover and identify rock samples that contain marsh fragments, and this is non-trivial. We then need to obtain a CT scan of the sample with x-rays. We need to segment the x-ray image into the different components, the different crystal phases, the glass and the bubbles. And we need to reconstruct the paleoporosity. We then have a virtual rock sample and we can computationally model its elastic response. And this gives us the effective elastic properties. The last two steps of this procedure are usually called numerical homogenization of the elastic properties. There are different approaches for numerical homogenization. Dynamic methods essentially simulate a wave propagation experiment. We can calculate P and S wave travel times, and if we repeat this in multiple directions, we can determine a full representation of the anisotropic VP and VS. On the other hand, static methods simulate a static load experiment. We model the deformation of the sample under multiple load cases in compression and shear, and we can calculate the stress strain within the sample and therefore the full elasticity matrix. So Andreas uh, Joachim has been working on developing a static homogenization method based on the finite elements approach. He has uh, set up a Python library that is on GitHub and will be freely avail available shortly. We've done uh, some benchmarks using uh, idealized geometrical shapes, including spherical inclusions and layered media. And we've shown that the method works and is accurate. We are now testing uh, applications of this method to real data sets. We have obtained data for a mush fragment from St. Kitts, and you can read all about that sample in a paper by Melikova et al. 2017. It's a coarse-grained uh, olivine amphibole gabbro cumulate with a 14% melt fraction. The CT scan data was kindly provided by Alison Rust from the University of Bristol, and her group has carried out the segmentation. We're using here a simple binary segmentation into two phases. One is the solid the crystals, and the other is a liquid melt. From the segmented image, we generate the finite element mesh, which is then uh, used to solve the elastostatic problem. We're still ironing out some uh, of the kinks in the meshing algorithm, so I can't show you any result for this method today. But I can show you some results for another method based on FFT homogenization. This is a computationally efficient approach because of the use of the FFT. It is uh, grid-based, meaning that there is no requirement for complicated meshing and it can be applied directly to the CT images. So from the CT image, we determine the average elasticity matrix. And if you're familiar with elasticity matrices, you will notice that there are off-diagonal elements that indicate that the sample is anisotropic. We can plot uh, pulse images for VP and VS, showing that there's a 4% VP anisotropy and a 6% VS anisotropy. And we could use these results to calculate, for example, shear wave splitting to interpret seismic data. What's more interesting is comparing these results to predictions using some of the semi-analytical methods that I mentioned before. I'm showing here predictions for the differential effective medium method, which assume, in this case, uh, oblate ellipsoidal melt inclusions. The blue and red crosses are VP and VS predictions for uh, our homogenization method for the KS21 sample from St. Kitts. And the black curves are the prediction for the DEM method for different aspect ratio of the ellipsoids. Now this shows that our sample has an equivalent aspect ratio 
or between 0 0.07 and 0 0.13. And this value is in line with what, what is um, commonly used in, uh, in the community for interpreting seismic data. But what we were able to, to do here is to really narrow the range of uh, aspect ratios that we consider. Of course, we can't fit a curve through a single data point, so we would need more samples to apply this in practice. So I envisage a sort of petrological volcano tomography. We would uh, go out in the field and look for and collect rock samples that contain mush fragments. We would then CT scan those samples and uh, calculate the elastic properties with the methods that I've described. We would then construct constitutive relationships that are based on the petrology and on the microstructure for this particular volcano. And we would use the new relationships to invert the seismic properties for melt fraction. So we're at the early development stage for this and I welcome any comments uh, both on mush microstructure and the homogenization methods. And if you've got uh, CT scan data for glomerocrysts or other um, samples that are relevant to this, uh, do send them along. In summary, if you want to go beyond producing blurry blobs and we want to push volcano tomography from being a qualitative to a more quantitative science, we have three main challenges. The first one is to widely adopt waveform inversion methods and make them more robust, and more easy to apply. The second is to better understand these constitutive relationships and the microstructure of crystal mushes and the relationship to seismic properties. And finally, something I haven't mentioned much today is to adopt multi-parameter inversion methods that give us constraints on multiple physical properties and therefore more robust uh, melt estimates. Thanks for your attention.